Hey guys, it's Beth and Brad with Bites and Buzz, and we're here at the Three Spirits Brewery in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is one of the more exciting breweries, and it's only been open since November of 2015, so they're just getting started. We're about to head inside and talk to Taboo and Jennifer about what got them into wanting to make this brewery happen, considering what their background is. What yeah. else do they have going on? They have a run group on Fridays, they have yoga on Sundays, and they also have an arcade day on Sundays as well, where the person with the highest score gets a free flight. And that's always nice, free. So we're gonna go talk to them, and we'll talk in a bit. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to, to sit here and talk to you guys about Three Spirits Brewery. Uh, this is one of the first places we showed up. Actually, our first night here, we met Taboo, and we didn't get the opportunity to meet Jennifer until just recently, so we wanted to come back, talk about everything that you've got going on, some of the background, and, and just give us a little uh, heads up about the future and some of your plans. Three Spirits is actually you know, back to the, the uh, Charles Dickens novel. Tell, tell us, you know, how did you come up with that the name? Three Spirits Brewery. Well, that's, the Christmas Carol is probably my favorite, one of my favorite movies. Um, I watch, I have, I probably watch at least two or three versions of it every Christmas season. Scrooge? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, I think my newest favorite one is the Albert Finney one because there's actually a song, I Hate People. <laughs> that's <good. laughs> and that's kind of how I started to feel in medicine. You know, you, you, you meet a population that is not very um, empathetic and returning of care. Um, so it's kind of hard to deal with them. Um, the emergency department, we deal with everybody that no one else wants to deal with. There's a lot of great patients, but it's just like any other job. If you have one person that sucks the life out of you, then that makes for a long shift. And you start to equate that with other people. So I kind of saw this whole thing parallel, basically, with myself and Scrooge, you know? Um, he started the movie off, like, and I felt that's how when people first met him. Like, people would meet me, and they're like, it's kind of crummy. Um, not that nice. Why is she married to him, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then you go back, you know, and then they're like, oh, how's he have all these friends that he's known from college for 20 years that still come and visit him every year for a Super Bowl party? Like, what are we missing? And I'm looking at the movie, I'm like, they're missing the person that I used to be. And that's why these people are still my friends and they're with me. And I want to be that person again because I recognize that I'm not that person again. Um, so, it, it, I mean, it is kind of like, I just felt like I didn't want to wait until I was 75 or 80 or however old Scrooge was before he changed things around. I had two small kids, so I had to make that change quicker. Um, and so I just thought that that would be a nice way to remind myself that um, with the name and the logo. You know, if I'm having a rough day here. Things aren't going the way they used to be or the way I want them to be. I kind of look at that and kind of remember why I did this. It kind of gives me a little bit of extra energy to kind of keep going. People come from the hospital and like, gosh, he just looks so happy. He looks so much healthier. Beer's healthy. No, yeah. <laughs> the people were around, you know, it's just a more pleasant environment, you know. If we'd go on vacation, we'd remember that people could be nice. Yeah. And now we have a place where people can come and everyone's nice. <laughs> yeah. We could do, oh yeah, people aren't so bad. We yeah. like these guys. Tell us a little bit about y'all's background, and that's part of the most interesting <laughs> aspects of the story. Um, well, I think the biggest part of our backgrounds were both uh, ER trained board certified emergency medicine physicians, uh, met in residency in Indiana, and um, moved out uh, to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, uh, near the Outer Banks, our first year out of residency. Um, that was too far away from civilization for one of us. So uh, we had a friend that was here in Charlotte, so moved here in 2002, and pretty much have been here since then, and um, practiced emergency medicine. I did until, I believe, 2012, um, and my wife did until last year. Last year. But your love affair with beer actually began while you were in medical school, I understand, right? It was, uh, well, my love, of, well, my love affair for beer probably started when I was way too young. <laughs> <laughs> but that was bad beer, so I don't know if that counts. Um, but uh, my love to uh, home brewing started in residency. Um, since I was in Indiana, um, and intern year is kind of grueling, um, they suggested that, um, our program director suggested that we find a hobby that we can do inside during the cold winter months of intern year. 
apparently I was the only one that listened to him say this, um, and I decided to do homebrewing. I had a college roommate that had done it a, a few times and um, was interested in it. I like to cook. I like the chemistry of mixing things together. Um, so that's kind of where it started. And it started there. Now, you are also a doctor. And how did you two guys meet? We actually were interviewing uh, for residency at Emory University, which neither of us ended up at. We just kind of crossed paths and ended up at Indiana University together. And I think I went to that party where he had a big unveiling of one of his first home brews. It was strong. And it was probably different. It was, it was, it was, it was very a, It was a Pilsner that was um, roughly it hot. tasted like a triple. And it was about 8% <laughs> <eight> alcohol. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty impressive. And so that was your first experience it with was. the beer. And then you how, tell, tell me more about your experimenting with the home brew aspect of it. Uh, well, that one, I mean, I started with the lager, with the Pilsner, basically because the instructions said uh, don't start with that one because it's the hardest one to start with. So I took well, that's it as where a you challenge exactly. um, and did that one. Plus, it was cold, so it was easy to get the fermentation temperatures because I did it in January in Indiana, so I could just leave the bucket out in the garage. Um, so uh, after that, I decided to uh, be a little bit more tame. And I think that um, after that, I just kind of started experimenting. And most of the beers I started experimenting with were just beers that I was interested in drinking, but not finding when we went out to places to have a beer. Hmm. So um, I think that like there had been a big wave of amber lagers, but then all of a sudden people weren't making them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I went to that one next. I think I was a little gun shy after the Pilsner, um, but did start doing porters because um, I did like porters, but didn't like the way a lot of people did them, thought that they were just too roasted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think after that, it was just playing around, basically just getting a book kit and just reading through and just whatever struck my fancy that day, just kind of made it. There you go. Along the way, I'm guessing you kept doing the homebrew and... Mm -hmm. yeah. You had a conversation one day and said, you know, I'm ready to start a brewery. Tell me about that. Uh, I think the conversation was more that um, we got in, we went into medicine and we had um, uh, an idea of what that lifestyle and what um, our work life would be like. Um, and quickly found that we had a great lifestyle but did not enjoy our work life nearly as much. And it was just starting to wear on our personal life. We spent a lot of time. We had kids, which threw a whole new wrinkle into everything. Um, but I think the biggest thing is kind of, and that's kind of where the name came from, just kind of noticed that um, we weren't the loving, happy people that we used to be um, when we first met. And the only thing that it really had changed was our career. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where the ball stuck. That's where it started. And then there was just events that happened that kind of just pushed us to push this board a little bit further. And then you decided to go back to school to study more about beer. I, I'm guessing you were thinking, well, I know enough about making, but well, what was the reasoning for that? The reasoning was is that I told my wife, I still remember the conversation on the couch, I said that um, I can do two things well besides medicine. Um, I can make beer, and I can also, like Puff Daddy, remember songs I liked when I was younger, remix them in a studio and make a lot of money. Huh? I was like, um, I think that making the beer would be a lot more fun, and I didn't think that she wanted me out with a bunch of groupies and out until three o'clock in the morning in Vegas. So she actually got up off the couch and just left the room and didn't say a word. And I thought, okay, I'm in trouble. So and we, I think we, I, don't even, I think we've been married for like maybe a year, a few months, maybe, or we're getting we're married. Engaged. Yeah. And uh, she came back and said, oh, well, your parents live in Chicago. Siebel Institute is there. It's the oldest brewing school in the country. Um, if you're going to do this, I want to make sure that you know what you're doing on a, on a more um, commercial scale. Um, so I think that if you're serious, I want you to do these classes. I'll go up there and I'm going to talk with the people and make sure that, you know, we're not crazy. Right. Uh, so home brewing is one thing and running a business and learning an industry is pretty important if you're going to sink that much money personal money into mm -hmm. into a into a new career plan. So we'll talk about starting this actual facility. Uh, I mean you, you, you in a big huge warehouse type of uh, setting, very similar to a lot of uh, uh, the breweries in the North Carolina, South Carolina area. However you've turned it into you've got a wonderful pub type setup, but what was your thought process when you were, you know, trying to decide to go? I mean you have a lot of facilities. So the idea is, is if we're going in, we're going in all the way, I'm guessing. Well, I, I talked to the um, brewer, um, head brewer up at um, Highland and a few years ago, and he said the biggest mistake that people do is they don't plan for success. Um, 
in that they um, kind of scrape together what they can, get into whatever range situation they can, and what happens is, is when they're successful, their businesses can't grow anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of stagnate a little bit because they need more space. So that was kind of the first thought, um, is that I want to be someplace where, you know, we plan on being successful. Um, I didn't want to have to move or do anything like that or have size be a constraint within the first few years while we're trying to build our audience. Um, I just thought if we kind of got to that point and then all of a sudden couldn't keep up or produce, we may lose that market that we fought so hard to get. And then it was also, when I was looking, it was right around the time that uh, OMB hit their third year mark and did have to actually move and get a bigger facility. Uh, I don't think that we'll ever be that huge. <laughs> um, I mean, but we were looking around and kind of, and then like I think the next year, um, Noda and Birdsong were kind of in the same situation too, uh, where they quickly out of their facilities. Um, when looking at buildings, uh, I tried to negotiate with landlords a three year option to buy out, mm -hmm. have them out of a five year lease, and all of them pretty much said no, so that was not an option. Um, which led us to having to, you know, probably buy a place 50% bigger than what we needed when we started. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at years three through five, not years one through three. Mm -hmm. And how difficult was the process of actually? Oh, it was, it was incredibly painful. It was, yeah. yeah. Before the first brewery in Charlotte opened, we were looking at property. We found out where theirs was going to be. They weren't even open yet. We were peeking in the windows. So it's been that long. Oh my gosh. Looking at zoning regulations, real, going through real estate agents, looking at properties. Yeah. It's the, been the property part was really hard um, because it was it was kind of a double whammy. Uh, you had the banks telling us that because I'm starting a new industry that I've never been in before, they didn't want to give us any money, even though I have a good backup plan. Um, I can go back and practice medicine again. They weren't interested in lending. Uh, landlords weren't interested in give us their space because a we're taking an industrial space going to make it into a production brewery which they don't really deal with you start talking to them about sloping floors and putting in drains and everything and they're like well we have to pay money to get it back to the way it was if you were not successful and so the bank wanted us to have a place set up and then the places wanted us to have a bank loan set up <laughs> so wow. it was just kind of going back and forth and I think what got us through and helped us the most uh, was the Winthrop Small uh, Business uh, Development Center. Mm -hmm. uh, they were phenomenal. Uh, I pretty much did all the writing of the business plan but uh, Forrest Norman uh, Jr. Uh, helped us do all the finances and uh, actually the, um, the head of the uh, of the Small Business uh, Development Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, they set us up bank meetings, uh, did our financials, and really helped us a lot. And basically helped us get our bank loan projections and everything. And went to meetings with us to try to talk banks into giving us money. So they really beat the, the pay for us. kind of a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. them. And we actually got our bank loan a year before we had our place. I would say I pretty much looked everywhere as far east as Independence, as far north as the Music Factory, as far south as the North Carolina, South Carolina border, and as far west as Kingston. So you went through the process, got everything set up, and then you eventually opened in November of this past year. Correct. So we're not even up to a year yet. And I've watched you know, the crowd grow and grow and grow, mm -hmm. uh, the food situation grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. uh, has it been you know, going along the plans that, that you were anticipating? Um, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been rising. Not as quickly as we would like. I mean, but I think that a part of that is that um, we we do like our spot. Um, there's just not a lot of built-in foot traffic around us, mm -hmm. so we're more of a destination spot than I thought that what we thought. Um, but I and I think that the craft beer industry is a little different right now than when we initially started looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, we like to focus on what we call comfort beers, you know. Um, and I think that and the reason we did that is because a I think people enjoy having a beer that they can drink multiple of without worrying about how intoxicated they're going to get or having to switch or how they're going to get home um, and all these beers weren't necessarily made to open a brewery they were made for parties that we had at our house for our friends to enjoy mm -hmm. and that's kind of the concept that we wanted to bring here um, just nice summer beers or warm weather beers and just and winter beers whatever just beers to kind of hang out and talk and be with your friends and enjoy yourself mm -hmm. um, the one thing I think that the problem we have is that our parties were people who were kind of in the transition from macro beers to craft beer. Mm -hmm. um, but the crowds that come in here are more craft beer people. And craft beer people want big beers and they want lots of hops in their beers. That's true. You know, you know we, we've had this discussion a lot of times. Uh, we're, 
we're high gravity people, but we have found ourselves in a situation where we're trying not to be as much. We prefer one or two beers and not have to drink a lot because you don't want to get too heavy. Um, but I actually like that you guys have a lot of different variety. A lot of places you go, it's all hops, or it's all of, you know, you know double or triple. I, I enjoy that comfort beer concept, so we, we drink a little differently when we come here. Uh, but l let's talk about your beers. I was going around to, like I said, most of these beers are made because I'm going places and there's something I want to drink and it's not there. Exactly. So I made these at home and that's why I did it because I like browns and I got tired of drinking Newcastle and Negro Modelo. That's true. <laughs> I don't even consider those browns, but I understand what you're saying. Right. <laughs> exactly. I did not either. That's why I made mine. <laughs> uh, so, so l l let's, you know, one of the interesting aspects of yours, because right now you, you have a porter, you have a brown ale, you've got an IPA which we've had several times. It's a good one. It's not too high. It's a uh, gateway. Right? Yeah, and, and that's a very good, very good gateway, but it also allows you to still go back and have a brown ale or an amber lager without your taste buds completely being destroyed. So, so without getting into all your beers, I'm interested in the names. Uh, you pronounce the one, the King Rasa Fasa. Yeah. Let's just give a little bit of background on that one. Tell us a little bit about that, where the name came from. Well, that's my dad. <laughs> um, he um, made up this fictional character, King Rasafasa, when he was playing with uh, my children and his nephew. Mm -hmm. They were his royal subjects, and he was King Rasafasa. And so I just thought that that was just a cool name and something that people didn't it wouldn't expect. And it was kind of like a nod to him, kind of thinking I was crazy, you know, because that was a hard conversation to have too with your parents. They, they put a lot of money and time and effort into me getting my medical degree. What other names have you come up with that you? Uh been family related or? Um, I think, well, Red Moon Rising actually is. It's, it's, that, that name has a lot of different meanings in it. Um, I was Googling and the Red Moon is what they used to call the moon, the full moon when moonshiners would go and make their moonshine. Um, my middle name, my kundu translates into red. Um, and my father's nickname um, in high school was red. Um, when he said when I was born, there was a red sunset. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I thought that that was important to put that name in there because that is the first recipe that I ever made from scratch. That was mine all grain. Really? It was a Red Moon Rising. And your Red Moon Rising is also one of the beers that won the U.S. Open Beer Championship this year. Yes, you got a silver medal. Very happy about that. And you also won for your Honey Porter mm -hmm. and your what? I got it. I got to have it. So tell us about that. How exciting was it, you know, walking in, being able to win these, uh, these awards, that just being brand new? Pretty surreal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm happy after the first one. You're looking at the feed. I'm like, oh, I got one here. You look at the other categories. Oh, I got another one. And the third one was just mind blowing. My favorite quote was, "I've never been so happy with second place." <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. He's not the kind yeah. of person to be happy with second place. No, he's very not happy at all. With second yeah. Place. Yes. yeah, but it's also a testament to the fact that you have come up with these comfort beers that are, you know, diverse as opposed to everybody competing for hops. What is your favorite style of beer then? If you, I don't think I have one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, w I would say that like I'm, I'm still in the stage of experimentation. I mean, there's still styles of beer out there that I read about in the World Beer Book that I haven't had yet. You know, that sound interesting that either I want to try to make or go out and taste and see what it's supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, it, and, and the reason that we have so many different beers here that are kind of all random is because they all fit my mood. Mm -hmm. um, each of these beers That's at true. a particular time is what I want to drink. Um, so that's kind of how we, I developed the board. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really think I have a favorite style. I have a favorite style that day. And if you, uh, if you notice me, when people notice when I'm in a tap room, that if I'm not working and kind of just socializing, I'll go around with a half pint. And it's very rarely the, sec the same beer in a half pint. And I just keep switching around. Do you have a favorite style of beer? It changes mm -hmm. as well, I would say. Right I now. was surprised that she liked the mango pale ale. Because that's yeah. kind of a little bit out of her range. She's usually around the wheats and the pilsners and the, yeah. and the lighter ones. And the, the, bliss, the lean wheat. The bliss was hers. That was that was her idea. She, she asked me to make her that. Do you see with some of the world beers that you've been looking at, mm -hmm. there's going to be any sort of changes or uh, any beers that are on the horizon? I mean, the pale ales always keep you know showing up, and, and that's a very good one. Uh, but what they, other they, beers? They are you? keep saying that the IPs are going to go away, but you know, just from the marketing and the sales people that were going out there, that's pretty much all they're about once are IPAs and sours. So I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I think it's, I don't know, I, I think, it depends on what population of people I think they're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's enough craft beer drinkers who 
when they, when they were introduced to craft beer, it was IPAs. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what they equate craft beer with, is a lot of hops. If there's not a lot of hops, they don't think it's as crafty as it should be. Um, so I don't know how much that shifts. I'd agree I, with that. I think that the shift will be um, not from craft beer drinkers. I think the shift is going to come if it comes from people who are drinking the big brands mm -hmm. who are switching, who, who demand more comfort beers. And that's kind of the niche that we're trying so to get. So when you, when you talk about that, let's talk about the, the marketing. And, and there is a lot of competition out there. From There's a strong the element of marketing and where you're on tap because we have a rather distinctive tap handle, which kind of helps mm -hmm. draw people's eye when they look up at the bar. So being out there on tap, just having our name on a tap handle is helpful. You know, so we're not really narrowing the market right now. We're just just trying to get the word out as far and wide as we can. Again, Tad and Jennifer, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, visit with us about it. We love this place. Looking forward to all the great things that are happening. And uh, anybody who's looking for us probably going to find us at the end of the bar. And you'll see us there later. Thanks so much. Right, thank you.